Let's stand together as we look into God's Word. <clears throat> and uh, this morning we continue our series, What Child Is This? Um, and we're looking at Mary's story, the story of Mary's son. And uh, we'll be reading from Luke chapter 1, verses 26 through 38. I invite you to turn to your Bible uh, in the Pew Bible on page 1588 or follow along in your own Bible or just listen as I read Luke chapter 1, verses 26 through 38. In the sixth month, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel said to her, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found great favor with God. You will be with child and give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. Now, how will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you, so the Holy One will be born, will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and and, and she who was said to be barren is in her sixth month, for nothing is impossible with God. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May it be to me as you have said. Then the angel left her. Let's pray together. Lord, uh, we come now to you and just ask, Father, that you would quiet our hearts and our minds before you. Um, Lord, you know our hearts and you know that uh, it's really hard probably for any of us right now to be really focusing on you um, and on your word. And yet, uh, Lord, you have a message for each of us in this this morning. And uh, you knew all this was going to happen before we got here. And uh, so we turn it all over to you and just ask for your presence and that you would help us to be able to focus on what you have for us in your name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. What child is this? I've asked myself this question some 30 years now, thirsty for the answer since the day he was born. What did I know then of great and mighty things? I was just a girl fetching water that day. The stranger appeared to me with those curious words. Greetings, favored one. The Lord is with you. He must have seen the change change in my face, the the one I now know to be an angel. Do not be afraid, he said. You will be pregnant with God's son, and he will be great, this child, forever and ever. And he will rescue his people. That was the exact moment. It was more than curiosity. I thirsted for more. I watched in silence as he was visited by shepherds and scholars, all with stories of angels and stars and grand pronouncements. One day, I found him in the temple. He was a boy. Speaking wisdom with men old enough to be his grandfather. And I am awed. And I am thirsty. And now, he's grown up, my boy. I watch him do and say curious and wondrous things. I hear him say, I am living water. Do I drink? Do I dare drink? Yes, 
I have been the favored one to see him grow into a man. What else will he do? Every step he takes seems to be filled with wonder. My baby, my boy, this man, my God. Yes. I look back on that night some 30 years ago now. And I remember holding him close, so thankful to be his mother, knowing this would be no ordinary child. I am still thirsty, yes, but I do believe I know where to find the water. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, um, as we come now into your lesson, I ask that the meditation of my heart and the words of my mouth would be pleasing and satisfying to you and encouraging to you even now as we lift our brother in Christ up to you. <clears throat> and we pray these things in your name. Amen. Have you ever been really thirsty? I mean, really, really thirsty, kind of like I am now. I've got super dry mouth for a lot of different reasons. Cold medicine does that to you. The obvious stress of what's going on right now does that to you. But you have, Jesus often used an example of the fact that he was the living water and talked about the, um, the power that water has to, to uh, quench thirst. And he used himself as that example of it when he says, I am the living water. And he said in, in the book of John, he says that I will provide a spring of living water that overflows from out of you into other people. And it's, it's those times when we go through struggles in life that we really need to have that, isn't it? When we really need to have that inner spring well up inside of us. As any child would do, Jesus displayed the attributes of his father. We talked about that last week with Joseph, how Joseph was a perfect example of God, the father adopting this baby boy into his family, just like God adopts us into his family. But he also displayed the attributes of his mom, and we need to realize that. Can you imagine what it would be unlike for them as parents? First of all, for those of us that are already parents, we know it's difficult. There's no owner's manual on parenthood. Becoming parents biologically seems to come naturally. We know how to do that. But to become parents in an emotional and relational wor world or sense is completely different. And so you have Mary and Joseph, this, this young couple that weren't even married yet, that were thrust into parenthood, plus the fact that they have the advantage of trying to parent the Son of God. How do you do that? How do you do that when you see this little one and realize that he was given life by the Spirit of God? Today we look at a woman that the Bible describes as being filled with favor. And unlike some churches, some religions that say that she was some sort of a special person, because of that there's some people that believe that Mary was perfect and that's why she was chosen by God, which is completely incorrect. Mary was no more perfect than anybody else. She was just an obscure teenage girl in an obscure village that happened to believe in God. But for whatever the reason, God chose her just like he chooses us, regardless of our background, regardless of what we have to offer. He's chosen us to be his child, and he chose her to be the mother of Jesus. You know, the Old Testament, a lot of people don't realize this, but the Old Testament has words for God, and some of those words are very masculine, and some of those words are feminine. And, and we don't realize that because we think of God as God the Father, and fathers are men, so we think God is a man. Well, God isn't a man. God doesn't have a sex, a gender. God is a spirit. And he, in that spirit, he, he encapsulate, it encapsulates the the emotions and the reason of both a man and a woman. That's one of the reasons why I think it's so interesting in Genesis when uh, 
Moses writes and he says, a man shall leave his mother and a woman leave her home and the two shall become one. Because in case you haven't noticed it yet, men and women are different, aren't they? Drastically different. In fact, uh, here in a few months we're going to be talking about the family and we're going to be talking about those differences and how they affect us. But if you take a man that has masculine and, and, and uh, manly tendencies and you take a woman who has feminine or womanly tendencies and emotions and you put them together, we call that marriage here, but what God talks about is that's making one person. And so God encapsulates both of those things. He's both feminine in some regards and masculine in some regards. And so when Jesus was born of Mary, he had the the attributes in some sense of God in a masculine sense, but he had the attributes of Mary in a feminine sense. That doesn't mean that he was less masculine than any other son. It just means that he got what you women get that us guys often over, overlook. I think there's three things that, generally speaking, women have over us guys that Jesus learned from Mary. One was the element of compassion. I mean, guys, we have to admit it. Guys have, or women are a lot more compassionate a lot of times than we are. A lot of times they're more patient and they're more tender. That's why when Johnny or Susie falls and, and scrapes a knee or, or cuts a finger or whatever, they go running to mommy. But if they're a football player and they're on the, on the field and they want to thank God, they thank God for their dad. It just kind of seems to work out that way. Not always, but generally speaking. So Jesus had both the imprints of his father and his mother. And, and we see that he was not only that, but if we talk about in uh, Philippians or back up to Hebrews 1, 3, it says, The Son of Man is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. And he had provided purification for sins. After he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. Imagine what that picture is. That picture tells us that Jesus is God. He's the exact representation of God. And so when we think of Jesus, and we have the advantage of thinking back to seeing Jesus in his life, when we think of that, we can realize that what we see in him, the actions we saw, his attitudes, his patience, his compassion, his love, was that of a father because he was God. Philippians chapter 2, verses 6 through 8 says, Who being in the for very nature of God did not consider equality with God something to be used in his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross. What amazing verses these are to us to remind us of the fact that, that Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, who is completely God, chose to come down and to be born like a mere mortal, like a mere man. He could have come as an angel. He could have come as anything he wanted. But he came like us. And he not only came like us as guys, but he came like us, and because he had the full nature of God, he had both the feminine as well as the masculine attributes and love of love and compassion. He was fully God and yet fully man. So when we ask the question, what child is this who lay sleeping on Mary's lap? He was the babe who would grow to establish care and compassion to others, just like his mother compared, com, uh, displayed to him. I want to share some verses with you this morning that show us that in the Old Testament, God the Father has given some, mass, some feminine attributes, if I can call it that. Take a look at what Isaiah chapter 66 says. It says, As one whom his mother comforts, so I will comfort you. You shall be comforted in Jerusalem. That's talking about God the Father, but it's talking about the fact that he'll be like a mom to us. I loved my dad. I loved my mom. I was blessed, blessed, extremely blessed with godly parents. Not perfect parents, but godly parents. And my mom showed me compassion. 
She showed me patience. (laughs) Believe me, she showed me patience. She showed me patience in a lot of ways. First of all, believe it or not, of the five boys that were born in my family, I was the rebel. Does that surprise anybody? Yeah, me neither. I was the rebel. I tended to get in more trouble than anybody else. And mom had patience with me. But also mom was patient because mom was a pastor's wife. And pastor's wives are probably have the hardest job of anybody else because they have to give up their husbands during the most inopportune times. Because whether a pastor is considered part-time or full-time on the pay scale, he's full-time on the emotion scale, which is why so much as possible, anytime I receive a phone call or a text message or an email, I have to step away from family to try to tend to that. And I'm not complaining. I'm just saying it's difficult for a mom and a wife to do that. But on the other hand, mom also defended my dad to the hilt. She made sure that us kids realized that he was still dad. Here's another verse that tells us about the way God acts. God is, uh, has the attributes of a woman, if I can say it that way. <clears throat> Isaiah writes, Can a woman forget her nursing child that she should not have compassion on the son of her womb? Even these may forget, yet I will not forget you. To me, there's nothing more tender, and obviously I don't, watch this, that'd be creepy. But there's nothing more tender to me than the thought of a mom nursing her baby. uh, Sociologists and psychologists, doctors have proven over and over again that there's a special bond that comes when a woman nurses her child. In fact, they found just the opposite, that that if they don't have that, that initial contact through uh, nursing or at least through other means that there's a, there's, it's a difficult, there's a bond that's broken. And so what, what God is saying through Isaiah here is he's asking us a rhetorical question. He's saying, Ask, answer this for me. If, if uh, you're a nursing mom, would you forget the baby of your womb? Would you forget this child that's, 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 uh, you're holding as, as it's feeding off of your breast? Would you forget that child? And the answer to the people that were Isaiah was writing to us, of course not. It's preposterous. And yet, Isaiah says, we all know it happens. We all know that in rare circumstances, a mom does neglect that baby. And then God says, but hear this, and hear this well. I will never forget you. No matter where you are, no matter what you have done, no matter what struggle you're going through, whether you're suffering from consequences of your own stupid behavior or you're suffering from the consequences of others' behavior or just because we're getting old, no matter what you're going through, never forget that I'm faithful to you, more faithful than a mom would be to her baby. Isn't that a great promise? A huge promise to us. Here's another one from Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 32, verses 11 and 12 says, Like an eagle that stirs up its nest, that flutters over its young, spreading out its wings, catching them, bearing them on its pinions, the Lord alone guided him. Eagles are amazing birds. They're huge. They're majestic. Their their claws are dangerous. They're harsh and they're hard. Eagles are strong. And yet if you've ever seen on a, a webcam or, or seen pictures of them with their children, with their babies, how gentle they are to them. And once in a while, one of those fledglings will, will for whatever the reason, maybe they're just rebellious like I was, they'll hop out of the nest, they'll fall out of the nest, and they'll plummet to the ground. And, and scientists have seen, or uh, uh, naturists have seen where the, the eagle will launch itself out of the nest and swoop down and grab that t- baby in those hard, sharp, dangerous claws gently and carry it back up to the nest. What a picture of a mom that we have in God that takes care of us. Here's another one, Psalm 22, verses 9 and 10. 
Yet you who took me from the womb, you made me trust you at my mother's breast. On you I was cast from my birth, and from my mother's womb you have been my God. This is an interesting verse, because if we look at what this verse is really talking about, it's talking about a midwife. And it's talking about the fact that we have been, God is like the midwife to us. And if, if for those of you that aren't familiar with the midwife, uh, we have doctors now that do it, but they're the ones that, that take the baby from the birth canal. And they know just how to do it so the baby doesn't get hurt. And they're gentle and they're caring. And they know exactly what to do to make sure that that baby comes out and it's healthy. And they do everything they can to make sure of that. And then they take that baby and they lay it on mom's stomach or on mom's chest so that it has that that warmth, that bond of mom. That's the picture that uh, Moses gives us in Deuteronomy of a God that loves us so much that he's like a mom, that he takes care of us from the very beginning. Last one, Psalm 71, 6. Upon you I have leaned from my birth. You are he who took me from my mother's womb. My praise is continually of you. Again, kind of that same picture of the fact that Regardless of who you are and what you've gone through, and you've heard this from me over and over again, and you will hear from me over and over again because we need to constantly be reminded of it. No matter what you have gone through, no matter where you are, God knows where you're at and he loves you and he will guide you. And like a, like a caring mother, he will take you in. Some of you are moms out there. Has there ever been a time, and you do not need to answer this, especially if your child is sitting beside you, Has there ever been a time in your life as a mom when you've had really, really mixed feelings about the child that you bore? There's a part of you that would like to wrap them in your arms and just pull you, pull them close because they're hurting because of whatever has happened and you just want to show them your love. But at the same time, while you're holding them close, you want to break their neck. Because there's a part of you that loves them and wants to comfort them, and there's another part of you that says, why did you do that? I'm asking moms this, dads, we're a whole different breed. That's what God is like in a sense, except for the fact that he never wants to break our neck. But he's the kind of God, the kind of mom in a sense, and I'm treading on thin ground, do not. This is on tape. Do not go home and say that I said God is your mother. That's not scriptural. God is your father, but he has mother-like attributes that says he will pull you in like a loving mom, no matter how stupid you are, no matter what you've done. What an incredible picture we have of God's love and compassion. And Jesus displayed these things towards his mother even. Remember the story, and we'll be uh, looking at this over the Easter time, I'm sure. Remember the story of when Jesus was on the cross Remember the time leading up to that. Now, remember what's happened. He's gone through the Last Supper. They've gone to the garden. All of his friends have abandoned him, every single one of them. He was betrayed by one of his best friends. He was beaten beyond recognition. He was bleeding profusely. He was in excruciating pain, more pain than any of us can ever imagine. He was hanging on the cross, and because he was hanging on the cross, he had a hard time breathing. And yet in the midst of that agony, as he's looking death in the face, he sees mom at the bottom of the cross. And the Bible just gives us the words, we can't hear how he said it. But he says to John, who is underneath the cross with mom, he says, He says to his mother first, he says, Woman, behold thy son. Son, behold thy mom. In his worst moment of his life, he thought of other people. And the reason I think that's so cool is because in the worst moment of our lives, it's the same thing. No matter what it is that you're struggling with this morning, we have a God that loves us like a mom and a dad that always wants to take us in. He was the one that was born of a manger. He is the one that died on a cross. What child is this? He's the one 
who loved others and his family to the very end. What child is this? He was the selfless one, the sacrificing one, the sacrifice beyond all measure. We have a hard time sacrificing sometimes. It's easy to, we might think of it this way, it's easy for us to sacrifice as long as it doesn't hurt us. You can't sacrifice without pain. You can't sacrifice without giving something. He did that. He's the one that was kind and considerate even when experiencing his worst day. He's the one who came willingly to go through the worst so that we can be made family. He's the one that deals with us, just like a mom deals with us. He's the one that deals with us with compassion. Look what Psalm 86, 15 says. But you, O Lord, are compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. That's what compassion is about. It's really, really difficult, and you know this, I'm not telling you anything new. It's really, really difficult to be compassionate to a jerk. Am I right? It's really difficult to do that. (laughs) But God did it for me, (laughs) and he does it for you. He's gracious. He's compassionate, slow to anger. You know, I have to admit, I have a fairly long fuse. But when it does get short, I need to watch out for myself. Because once you get angry, you've done two things. First of all, you've destroyed any chance at building a relationship. You're going to destroy it. The second thing is you've destroyed any chance that you have of showing other people what God is like. Because if you think of Jesus, the only time he ever got angry was when he got angry at angry at uh, religious people that were so tied to their religion that they couldn't see God. He never got angry at the prostitute. He never got angry at the one that didn't believe. In fact, when it says the young, rich young ruler walked away from him, he watched him walk away in compassion. Did he go after him? No but he watched him go away in compassion. Jesus showed us what he learned from his mom because he was compassionate. The second thing is patience. (laughs) Something we all struggle with, isn't it? First Peter, look what Paul says when he's writing to, to Timothy. Timothy is his young, uh, Paul is his mentor. Timothy is a young pastor in the church in Ephesus. And he writes to him, he says, but for many, for that very reason, I was shown mercy so, so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his immense, in me, immense, sorry, immense patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. It's interesting that what Paul refers to himself as here. He says he's the worst of all sinners. I would tend to disagree with him. I think I'm worse. But the picture of what he's showing us here is important because unless we see who we are, unless we really realize who we are, it's hard to be patient with other people. I remember reading a story about a guy that was uh, driving down the road and um, the guy in front of him had his turn signal on and didn't turn. Have you ever had that happen? Doesn't that annoy the snot out of you? And pretty soon another car went by and pulled right in front of him and turned a signal, turn signal on and didn't, didn't turn. What's going on? Two or three other cars did that. And then he looked at his dashboard. Every one of those cars was trying to send him a signal. Hey, buddy, your turn signal's on. See, he was so busy looking at everybody else's problem, he didn't see his own. When we really see who we are, if we get to the point where we can realize that, you know what, you may have hurt me, you may have offended me, you may have really treated me bad, but I'm worse than you. Until we get to that point, it's hard to be patient. And that's what Paul is really saying here. He's saying, God showed me so much patience because I was so lousy that... I've got to be patient with you. 
I've got to be patient with other people because of how patient he's been with me. My mom was so patient. I remember one time I uh, decided not to come home and go camping with friends. I didn't realize until years later that my dad had driven by the backyard about six times to make sure I was okay. And I got home the next morning feeling really guilt-ridden, and um, my mom wasn't happy with me. And um, I won't say what I said back to her, but it wasn't very (laughs) pastoral, Christian, or loving. I've never seen her so hurt. But she didn't do anything. In fact, that was the worst part. She should have probably just taken the broom she was using to sweep the floor and broke it against my backside. (laughs) That's what I deserved, and I didn't get it. What I got instead was a hurt look, and I thought, man. All of a sudden I realized I really wasn't a very good person, but how patient she was. That's the kind of patience God has with us. So don't be afraid if you've made mistakes. Don't be afraid if you're dealing with stuff from your past. Don't be afraid to come with him, come to him for it, because A, he already knows, and B, it doesn't matter because he loves you and he'll reach out to you. The last thing that we see is tenderness. Jesus says in Matthew twenty three thirty seven, he says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those who sent you, how often I would have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings and you weren't willing. Picture it, Jesus is up on a hill looking over the city of Jerusalem, realizing that's his town. Those are his people, that's his family. And they rejected him. And how much he would have loved to just reach in and grab him in. We have a friend who's going through an incredibly tough time right now. Mom and dad are very good family. I mean, you look at them on the outside, they're a great family. Uh, They had one daughter. They've treated her well and fairly. They haven't spoiled her or anything. But she's had a comfortable life. It's been good. Except right now she's dealing with an eating disorder. And she's at risk. And I've talked to my friend, and he just said, you know, mom and dad are distraught. What do we do? We've done everything that we could to give her a good life, and we love her, but this is out of our control. We can't handle this. And that's kind of how Jesus felt in a way. You know, he, he said, I'd be like, you've, you've all heard stories of, of a fire, you know, the fire that go, a wildfire that goes through a farmyard and the farmer was out, you know, looking through and he found a bunch of chickens that had died in the fire and he kind of kicked one of the carcasses of a hen and little baby chicks ran out. Mom had given her life to protect those chicks. That's the kind of love Jesus has for us. The kind of love says, I'll give anything for you. He's the one who was born in a manger, but he'd also be the first one to be born from the dead. And he did that for us. We need to be Jesus in skin, folks. Stories about a little boy that was in bed sleeping and a storm came through and the thunder scared him. And he went in and he said to mom and dad, can I get in bed with you? I'm scared. And dad took him back to bed and said, honey, you just need to stay here in bed. Every time a thunder crashes and every time you see lightning, I want you to remember Jesus is with you. And he left and went back to bed. The storm continued. There was one great big loud crack of thunder that sounded, a flash of lightning, it sounded like probably hit next door. And there was a pause for a minute. And then the little boy came back in, touched mommy and said, Mommy, I'm scared. And as the story goes, the mom was just getting ready to say, Honey, we told you Jesus is already with you. And then she heard this little voice. She said, Mommy, I know Jesus is with me. But right now I need Jesus in skin. Right now I need you to hold me. You know, sometimes it's not just enough to say God loves us, God loves you, but we need to be Jesus in skin to other people, to be that living water that Mary talked about in the video and have that living water overflow to other people. The same compassion, the same tenderness, the same patience that God has shown you, through the Holy Spirit of God, we need to show to other people. 
That's what it's about. I'll close with this. Matthew 5, 15 and 16 says this. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. What child is this? This is the child who gives us living water so that we can overflow with that living water to those that are around us. Let's stand together as we close. Oh, Lord Jesus, I just thank you for the power of your Holy Spirit in this place this morning. I thank you that you are a God of tenderness, a God of compassion, a God of patience. As we think right now of ourselves, I pray, Father, that you'd help us to see ourselves clearly so that we can see others clearly. Help us to realize how patient you are with us, how tender you are with us, how compassionate you are with us, so that we can be compassionate with other people. And then we thank you, Lord Jesus, for the baby in the manger and for the love and the compassion and the tenderness that he's shown each of us. And I pray this in your name. Amen.